So let's define the problem space first. So here we are, we're in our project, right? We've got some sort of project we're working on. And the idea is that we're going to have these third-party dependencies for, I don't know, maybe we're using UUIDs, and we're using databases, and we're doing all these things. And so ideally, we've got a project. And what we've decided to do, a traditional thing that we, we've done even 10 years ago um, in Go is, what we're going to do is add a folder called vendor, vendor folder to our, our project structure here that we're going to save. Or maybe we don't want to save in GitHub. So here's the idea, right? If we're going to be using some sort of UUID package, right? I want all of the code that we need from that package here in our vendor folder. Maybe we're going to use some sort of database package. We're going to bring all that code in as well. And so um, when we build the different applications associated with this project, we can point to this vendor folder uh, for these particular pieces of source code, and we can build everything. That's cool. But ideally, I don't want to save the vendor folder in GitHub with the project. What I'd like to do is to be able to recreate this vendor folder every time I need it. So maybe what we can also do um, inside of our vendor folder is we add some sort of file you know, that identifies the, the depths that we have. Maybe we just call that our, our depths.txt file. And that will list that you need UUID and you need database and gives us enough information about where that is on GitHub, let's say, to get it. And then this might be the only thing that we have to save. So maybe we don't, we don't put this let's say, under, under vendor, right? So here's our project again. Here's our project, right? And inside the project, maybe we have our, our uh, depths.txt file, which lists out the UUID package we're using and the DB package we're using. Um, it tells us, again, it's on GitHub. It tells us um, some other, right? Let's just say right now, it just even tells us that it's, it could be the fully qualified URL, for all I care. And then the idea is we're going to build some CLI tool that we can read the depths.txt file, identify that we want UUID off of GitHub and DB off of GitHub, and it can recreate this vendor folder with all that source code that we need. And so I only have to save this part in, in GitHub. Everything else can be generated off of our CLI tool. And we build this. We build this little CLI. We have our little manifest, right? Our depths.txt, a manifest file, tells us GitHub, uh, UUID, maybe GitHub, some other package, DB. And this is working. It's actually kind of brilliant. Because now, if I go into my CI, CD environment, no big deal. I just always make sure that I run the CLI tool, and it goes and it downloads everything in vendor. And then the Go build can kind of build it. It's beautiful. In fact, it's so beautiful, other people decide um, that they, they want to use it. And we're all sort of using it. And then one day, something bad happens. We've been deving off of this tool for a while. And one of the things that we did on the CLI tool was that if the UUID package was already there, like on local disk, I mean, we didn't download it again. No big deal. We had it, right? We only downloaded it when it wasn't there. So if we're in CI, CD, we, we clone the repo. It's not there. The CLI tool would, would bring it down. But what happened was is we got a new developer that came in. And when the new developer um, ran their, their code, they ended up getting a different version of UID. Maybe this actually happened in CI, CD. And maybe this has happened in production. But we didn't identify it until this new developer came in. In other words, the code that I've been deving on for the last three months is not the code that we've been running in production. Because this UUID, the code um, changed. It got changed out from underneath me. Now, you might say, well, Bill, you know, haven't you been also maybe dealing with some sort of tag or commit ID. And I could say, yeah, I mean, I've been, I, I've been storing the ID of some tag 
But that didn't even help because the developer for this package, they changed the code and then reapplied the tag, and I didn't even know about it. Now, that scares the hell out of me. I'm like staying up at night because now I've got no guarantee that the code I've been deving on is the same code that we've been using in production. And I don't know what this change was. I mean, obviously, it didn't break the build. So at least some social contract was maintained. But at the same time, I don't know like, what's going on. Maybe there's some now security risk. I mean, we can assume that we're running our tests in CI, so the behavior is fine. But this should scare us. Like, we don't want this. So we step back and we say, OK, how can we prevent this from happening again so we can identify this problem so that code never ends up actually getting built and getting put in production? So what we decide is the following. We're going to create a database. And in this database, what we're going to do is track any sort of package and its tag of code that we're using. So the first time that any project um, uses a particular new package, we're going to write some information to a database. And ideally, what we need is two things, really. We need the name of the package. And then what we're going to do is generate a, a hash of this package. So here's the idea. Um, we now need this UUID at some tag, right? Let's say it's the first time we're bringing it in. So our little CLI tool, what it can do is say, OK, we need this. So we can come, it can come fetch it, and it can put it in the vendor folder. That's beautiful. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the code that came here, and we're going to perform a hash of that code. Maybe we're going to use the SHA-256 algorithm. We can use any hashing algorithm that we want. We just have to make sure that when it comes to a hashing algorithm, that it always maintains these three properties. That given the same input, we get the same hash. That if we change even just one byte of input here, the hash is completely different. There's no way of correlating that this hash was somehow connected to this code. So even just one byte of change creates an entirely different hash. And that there's no collisions. There's no way that these bytes and these bytes can produce the same hash. This is like core sort of hashing algorithm 101 that we need. The SHA-256 does this for us very well. I'm not sure they have found any flaws. Every once in a while, somebody's able to find that an algorithm breaks one of these three things, which we all panic, right? Because now we've got problems. But I think that we use SHA-256. We're good. And so what I'm going to do here is write in our database UUID under this tag, and it's going to have this hash. I'm just going to come up with some weird numbers and letters here, right? A hash. And that hash represents the source code that we're using. So anytime I hash this, I should get that value. In other words, if I hashed this, I would have gotten a different value. And so we're also using the DB. So DB tag, and then that gives us a different sort of hash. Now, this is beautiful, right? This is beautiful. Why? Because now let's say that that new developer just came in to work. We tell them, clone the project. They clone it. And then we tell them to run the CLI tool and so you can fetch everything under vendor. So now what happens? Fine. We read the depths. It says, go pull that code here. Great. So UUID comes down. We, we, we right, put all that code. And now what the CLI tool can do is hash this and compare it with the database. If it matches, OK, then we have the same exact code that we've always had that we expect to have. Now it can download DB, and it can do this, and it can hash it. And again, if that changed, we'll know about it. We'll know about it. At least we'll know about it. And we can pause and try to get a sense of, OK, some funny things are going on. Because that version, right, that version of DB, that tag we have, isn't the exact same bytes that we saw you know, the first time that we saw it. So this solution can be really, really good. Because now, 
if this developer here does play some games and retag some code changes, at least the build will break, right? The build will now break. And that gives us an ability to now decide how we want to sort of handle this problem. And so we put this in place, and you know what? It's working great for our team. And, and once again, at some point, we found out that one of these dependencies, the, the developer didn't maintain some social contract, and they, and they broke the build. So at that point, other people in the company are starting to see how cool this is, and they want to start using it for their projects which is pretty awesome, right? Like everybody decides they want to start using it. And so what we do is we give everybody the CLI tool, but we decide as a company, you know, since we're all pretty much using the same sort of dependencies, that what we want to do is kind of centralize this database, maybe, you know, at headquarters in Miami. And what we'll do is everybody can kind of um, access this database directly. And so we, we stand up the database, we've got our CLI tool, it's coming in and sort of everything's working and ev everything's good, right? Everything's good until <laughs> somebody at corporate does something bad. What happens? Okay, this happened. This happened to us here. Remember, we've got teams everywhere using this database. When they identify there's a problem, then what they need to do is go ahead and maybe use a different version or something. They do these things. But we did something really bad. When this problem occurred, we decided to do the following. We decided to come into the database and change the hash. We decided to do that and start saying, fine, this is now the code that should match UUID. And that stopped our build from breaking. However, this was a centralized database, and now that suddenly caused everybody else's code to break. We kind of violated some sort of agreement here. But this database was supposed to be the proof, like the point of truth, for any version and tag that we're using, suddenly we found out that some code had changed. We were willing to use it as is. We went into the database to stop our tool from breaking, and that broke everybody else. And now everything's in an uproar. In fact, so much of an uproar that now our people are seriously concerned that maybe we've been changing other things also over time. And that's not going to work. That if this is going to be a global solution for the company, then everybody's got to trust that, that, right, that the data that's written here isn't ever modified. This is our point of truth. This is what's keeping our levels of security, reproducibility, and durability high. And somebody just can't come in and do that. And so we're told now by management that this is a critical system. And we've got to be able to now create a way for everybody to have trust in the system. And there needs to be trust. And so we're, we're sent back to our desks now to think about how we add trust to the system.